Start the recording. Okay, we are live. Audio and video is up and running. I hope everybody had a relaxing break uh, and uh, you're fired up and ready to finish out our last week of the semester. It is over after this week. We have this week and we have the final. So um, the first thing I wanted to do is talk about a little bit of housekeeping today. Um, so let's let's go through the the grades for the course because really that's that's you know uh, in terms of housekeeping that's sort of what I mean. So first off, attendance grades are up to date. Obviously, uh, homeworks the outstanding homework assignment before the uh, the break was graded. So that's done. Uh, your homework seven is going to be uh, assigned today. Uh, also, in terms of the exams, obviously exam one and exam two are graded. Exam three uh, is also graded. Everybody got their grade reports, uh, and I posted the video to teams going through the statistics and, and whatnot. Worth, uh, worth a look. Um, one other thing I posted to teams, and I'm curious if some folks in the class saw this. Uh, if you're in chat, uh, let me know. I'm curious to see how this worked out. I posted a file called the at home game. Uh, I'll tell you what that's about. Um, a buddy of mine in grad school uh, by the name of Scott Morgan, he would, what he would do is he would take the grade distribution, you know, like for the class. So this is the grade distribution for statics. And he would know what his attendance grade was and he would know what his homework grade was and what his three exams were. So he would do the back calculation to figure out what he needed to make on the final in order to get, you know, like an A or a B or whatnot. And he called that playing the at home game. So I posted a spreadsheet uh, to Blackboard uh, called the at home game. And the way it works is you can input your grades, your attendance grade, your homework, exam one, exam two, exam three, and it'll tell you what your grade is in the class. And then it'll also tell you um, what target grades you need to get on the exam in order to get certain letter grades. Uh, I highly recommend that you check it out and mess around with it. Um, uh, uh, a couple things. Uh, number one, uh, I do round at the end of the day. So for instance, if you have like an 89.7, I round that up to a 90 and you would get an A. So I always round to the nearest percentage point. So to me, an A is like an 89.5. It's not a, a 90. So uh, I did build that into the spreadsheet. Also, the spreadsheet will tell you uh, whether or not um, uh, your you know certain grades are not possible or whether or not certain grades are guaranteed. So for example, um, you know if you've been getting like 95s on everything, you're like guaranteed uh, at least a D or a C or something like that, depending upon the grade distribution, because the final exam is only worth 15% of the grade. Uh, so it tells you whether it tells you what you need to make on the exam in order to get certain grades, and it also tells you whether or not you're guaranteed at least you know certain letter grades. And so hopefully it, it reassures you and, and lets you know where you're at in the class and whatnot. And I thought that would be a, a nice thing to do as we close things up. Um, now this doesn't really matter so much for this class because we've been online this entire semester, but now every one of your classes are online. And uh, I don't know how, you know, uh, how, how some of your other faculty or whatnot are handling this. Everybody's going to probably do something differently. But I thought it would be worthwhile to discuss what I'm calling remaining housekeeping in Engineering 213. In other words, like, what do we got to do between now until this whole, this whole class is, uh, is, is done and over with? So uh, I, I prepared a couple slides to that effect. So let's talk about the homework assignments. So um, I have here one more homework assignment that's kind of deceptive because I have some bonus assignments coming up. So let me explain. Uh, I know I had originally said we were going to have two lectures on friction, but I started building the notes over break, and I don't really think it's all that necessary to do two full-blown uh, uh, lectures on friction. I think but based on everything that we've already covered throughout the course, friction's really just one more factoid on top of everything else. So I figure we could probably cover friction in one day. And so that's what we're going to do today. And you'll kind of see what I mean when it's like friction's just, you know, you're just doing all of the, the static equilibrium problems that we've done before. You just add this little fact, uh, this little, you know, parameter to it. Uh, so we're going to have one lecture on friction. 
Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about the remaining lecture schedule on Wednesday uh, and Friday. So you're going to have one homework assignment on that. Now, um, one of the things about this class, this is my first time teaching statics, and I'm definitely one to want to improve. Uh, so I wanted to give you a, a little bit of uh, incentive to complete the course evals and the course learning outcome survey. So this is going to turn on on Wednesday and I'll mention this on Wednesday as well, but let me explain how this is going to work. So there's two surveys that I want you to complete. There's the course eval survey. That's the one that's administered by the university. The one that's, you know, general about, you know, just the class as a whole. And then there's the course learning outcome survey, which I'm sure if, if you've had some engineering courses before, you've done this in, in some of your classes. These are the ones that are more specific to the outcomes in, in this class. So, you know, how are you feeling about moments and forces and, and, and so on and so forth. And there's this, it's a short little uh, survey that I put together there. The two surveys are completely anonymous. You could say I'm the, I'm the worst professor ever. <laughs> but but in all seriousness, like I said, this is the first time I've taught the class, and I definitely want to do better. And and, and I, if you have any suggestions for, you know, how to do this uh, in the future, this has definitely uh, been an experience for us all. So um, any feedback that you could have would be, would be greatly appreciated. And I want to um, – Yes, yes, I, I'm going to mention that here in a second, but you're, yes, you can. So um, what, what you're ultimately going to do is for the course evals, um, if you go to your course eval on MyMU, I don't want to see your results. I don't want to see how you, you know, like what you answered. I just want to see that you did the survey. So uh, as, as uh, Carrie uh, asked, what you can do is go to your survey list and you could show like, there, there's a list that shows either your completed survey list or your one that says remaining surveys. And I've had students who upload the remaining surveys list and it shows that there's nothing there. And that's fine too. Just as long as you show me that, you know, this, this uh, uh, survey is completed, I, I'm good to go. Uh, and so, I, you know, any way that you do that is fine. But if you upload a screen capture that shows that you've just done the survey, again, you could say whatever you want on the survey. I, I just want to see that you've done it. I will give you 10 bonus homework uh, or 10 bonus points on your homework average. And if you do the course learning outcome survey, I'll give you another 10 bonus points on, on your homework average. And that's on top of the homework or the, the points that you've already earned on your homework average. So just so you kind of understand the parameters, if you have been a rock star student throughout the semester and you've gotten perfect grades on all of your homeworks, can you get a homework average over 100%? Yes. Yes, you can. So I'm, I'm adding that on top of your, uh, of your homework average. Uh, I'm going to turn that on on Wednesday, uh, and then that'll be open until Friday. So you can sort of think of, like, that's your homework assignment between Wednesday and Friday is just those surveys, because I'm not going to have another uh, uh, homework assignment in the course. Speaking of, like, here's what we're going to talk about for the rest uh, of this week. So um, today we're going to talk about friction. That's going to be our, our topic of discussion for today. It's, it's also the reason why my camera angle is a little weird because I wanted to show the table and so that's why it's pointed uh, down. Uh, so we're going to talk about friction today and then as you remember the, the final in here is comprehensive. So what I'm going to do for that is on Wednesday I'm going to kind of just talk about the class as a whole. I'm going to give you the, the logistics on the, the exam. It's sort, going to sort of be like our exam review, like we've done in the past, but there's going to be a lot more to it because we, you know, it's going to be sort of the class as a whole. So I'm going to talk about the class as a whole, and we're going to start to sort of open up the questions on the final. But because the, the final's comprehensive, you know, there's a lot of topics on the final. So, um, on Wednesday, we'll go through the, you know, the, the, the logistics and the coverage on the final, and then we'll open the floor for questions, but I don't think we'll, we'll finish those questions on Wednesday. So Friday, we're just going to show up, and I'm going to say, hey, everybody, welcome to Statics. Let's break out the questions. And so it'll be a full-blown just Q&A session for the exam in case there's any outstanding questions on the exam. The exam is going to be on Friday, December 11th. Um, it's uh, uh, our exam slot. We drew the, the, the short straw, I guess, because ours is like the last time slot on the last day. So I'm going to have to grade these quick. <laughs> um, they, uh, it's going to be similar logistics. It is a two-hour exam. 
uh, you have like the university gives us a 120 minute time slot. I'm designing the exam to be 100 minutes long, so it's you know uh, just like a 50 minute exam times two, uh, and it's going to be comprehensive. It's going to cover everything in the class, uh, including friction, which is what we're covering today. Um, any questions before I dig right into our topic for today? I'll give everybody a sec because I know we that, that was probably a lot of info all at once. All right, uh, let's talk about friction. Okay, so this is sort of our last topic in statics, but it builds on everything we've done up until now. Oh, hold on. I'm saying uh, that. Okay, so both of the extra credit components are going to open Wednesday, both of them. So what you're going to do for the, uh, so there's two surveys. There's the university administered survey and there's the course learning outcome survey. What you're going to do for both of those surveys is you're going to complete them and then for both surveys, upload a screen capture to Blackboard telling us that, telling me that you've done them. Uh, and, and those will both open Wednesday. You, now, the university administered survey, you could do it now, but I'm, I'm going to have the upload uh, uh, open on Wednesday so that, you know, they're, they're all, it, I, ha I haven't turned it on yet. I was going to turn it on on Wednesday. And, and there's a reason for that. The reason why is, uh, th th that's a fair question. The reason why is because the survey is uh, asking, like, how well you feel about friction, and we haven't talked about that yet. So I wanted to cover friction first so that, so that now that you now that we've done it, you're like, okay, now I now I uh, I understand. That's why I held off until Wednesday. Any other questions? Okay, all right. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about friction. Okay, now the first thing that we kind of need to discuss is the cons. Is there? There's actually two different types of friction that we experience in physical systems. And this is actually a really easy concept to understand if you've ever done anything like moving furniture. How many people in the class have like helped a friend move furniture? And like, let's say you're pushing a couch across the living room or something like that. Has anybody in the class ever done that? Ever, you know, moved a couch or, a, okay. So I've already got some people saying, saying no. Um, Okay, too, too far too many times. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I remember that those days as well. Um, now, if you and I'm going to use the example of pushing a couch across the room because it's it's the one that's I guess the most visceral that that, I, that I'm thinking of. Um, would you agree with the statement that let's say you're pushing a couch across the living room that it's harder to get the couch moving than it is to keep it moving? Like you're pushing the couch across the room and it's like once it starts moving, you got to keep it moving or it gets harder to get it started back up again. Does everybody, would everybody agree with that statement? Okay. I got one. Yeah. And I got, uh, I got a lot, a lot of people saying yes. Okay. So what we're talking about there is the effect of friction. Now there are two types of friction that, uh, deal with in physical systems, and that's the concept of static friction and the concept of kinetic friction. So static friction is the force that's developed that impedes motion, and kinetic friction is the force that's developed during motion. What you'll find is that static friction, or the maximum amount of force that can be generated before movement starts, is always more than the kinetic friction component. In other words, it like physically, it's actually harder to get the object to start moving than it is to keep it moving. Okay, and that is related uh, through this coefficient of friction that we're going to see here in a second. But that is represented in the math that we're going to see here in a bit. Now, the two important parameters that affect friction it are are as follows. So, so problems involving friction are always concerned with objects and contact. So I don't know if you see here 
my, uh, my calculator, right? So here's my calculator. My calculator is on the desk, okay? So right off the bat, this is a problem involving friction. Okay, let me move it back here so it's a little bit more in frame. So here's a problem involving friction. It's a problem involving friction because there's two objects in contact. There's the calculator and the table, okay? And so what I'm trying to figure out is the force that's developed between these surfaces, right? So if I take this calculator and start sliding it, okay, it starts moving along the, the starts moving along the table, but it, it's not like the table's covered in Crisco or, or vegetable oil or something like that. It, it's, it, I have to put some force in order to get the, the calculator to start moving because there is a friction developed between the calculator and the table, okay? And problems involving friction are always a function of two parameters. The first is the nature of the contact. And so the, the easiest way to explain that is, so if I have this calculator on this table, what are the surfaces that are in contact? Well, the table is made of wood, right? And the calculator, if I look at the bottom of the calculator, I've got these little like rubber pads. I don't know if you can see those. So what I'm talking about is a contact involving a wooden surface and a rubber pad. And so that's the first per, uh, parameter is the nature of the contact. This contact would be different if I was, instead of wood and rubber, what if it was wood and plastic? What if I had this water bottle? Okay, that's going to behave differently because the contact is different between the wood uh, and the plastic. Wood and plastic have different properties than a contact of wood and rubber. Okay, the other parameter that affects uh, uh, friction is the amount of force generated between surfaces. We call this normal force. Okay, and here's the easiest way to explain it. Okay, so here's my coffee cup, right? Okay, so here's my coffee cup, and I've got my coffee cup and I want to push the coffee cup across the table, right? So if I push the coffee cup across the table, it takes a certain amount of force to do that. Now, imagine what happens if I take the coffee cup and I fill it with a fluid, okay? What I just did is I took the, the object in question, mainly this coffee cup, but what I've done is I've increased what we're calling its normal force. So what I mean by normal force, this is a plane, Remember in cross product plan, uh, vectors that are normal to the plane, right? Perpendicular in all directions. So I've increased the normal force between these two objects. And I did that by filling the coffee cup. Basically the coffee cup got heavier, okay? Now what happens is, now the coffee cup got heavier. Now if I push it, it takes more force. It's not as easy to push this across the table because there's more normal force, right? So one of the parameters that affects is normal force. The other is the nature of the contact. And, then, and they both can have significant impacts. Let me sort of show you what I mean by that. So check this out. This is my sort of, you know, portable water jug, right? Stay hydrated. Okay, this whole thing is full, and this is kind of heavy, right? So this is a pretty heavy object, and now, you know, I can... You know, with a little bit of effort, I can push that across the, uh, uh, across the table. Now watch this. This is my tape dispenser. This tape dispenser is much lighter than this bottle, right? If I compare the weight of this bottle versus this tape dispenser, this, this bottle is way heavier. Now watch this. If I put the tape dispenser on the table and I push, it's actually a lot harder to push the tape dispenser than it is that bottle. And the bottle is way heavier. And the reason why is because of the nature of the contact, right? So this is, you know, we're talking about just this, you know, sort of like brushed metal surface against the, um, against the wood. That's a different contact than what's going on with the tape dispenser. The tape dispenser has this, like, gasket on the bottom. And that gasket is designed to be anti-skid. It's not sticky. It just, it's designed such that the coefficient of friction between this uh, this you know surface and what you would find on a typical desk like a wood wooden surface or something like that is quite high so it's it's actually pretty tough to move because it develops a lot of friction okay and so those are really the two parameters that affect friction uh, in, in physical problems is the force uh, the 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 normal force between the two objects and the coefficient of friction 
Okay. And the way that we uh, compute the frictional force that you develop between planes is a function of the normal force and the coefficient of friction. Now, there are two different coefficients of friction. There's a coefficient of static friction and a coefficient of kinetic friction. So I'm just curious, before we move on to slides, which do you think is always larger, a coefficient of static friction or a coefficient of kinetic friction? I'm curious what the class thinks. There you go, exactly right. It's always harder to get a, an object started to move before it is to keep moving. But get, going back to that example of pushing the couch across the, the floor, it's harder to get that couch started than it is to keep it moving. Same logic applies here. Coefficients of static friction are always higher than coefficients of kinetic friction, okay? So let's talk about each of these, ob, or each of these parameters. Let's talk about the coefficients. So coefficients of static friction are about the nature of the contacts, not necessarily a function of the surface area. It's more about the, the nature of the two surfaces. So, the, you know, we could determine this in a lab pretty easily. So let's say we were trying to find the coefficient of static friction between, I don't know, steel and wood. So I'd get a block of steel and a block of wood, and I would... Uh, apply a normal force between them, something that's measurable, and then I would apply a, you know, a lateral force and then keep applying that load until it starts to move. And once it starts to move, divide the two, bam, there's my coefficient of friction. But even then, you know, first off, there's going to be some scatter. If I took that experiment and I repeated it over and over and over and over again, I'm going to get variability in the data. That's just, you know, physics. Um, and then also, what do I mean by metal and what do I mean by wood? You know, I said steel and wood, but what grade of steel am I talking about? Is it carbon steel? Is it stainless steel? You know, what, what are we talking about? What type of wood? Is it Douglas fir? Is it Georgia pine? What, what are we talking about here? Um, and so typically what you'll find um, in a statics textbook, this is the table from your statics textbook, is it gives you a range, you know. So if we're talking about metal on leather, then the coefficient of static friction is going to be somewhere between like 0.3 and 0.6. Um, if you're talking about hyper-specific design situations, you're either going to have to compute a value from, you know, going out and testing it in the lab, or maybe you can refer to specifications. So I'm a civil engineer and I tend to refer to everything in steel design and concrete design, those are, you know, my, my subject matter areas. So in steel design, when we design slip critical connections, we have a mu value that we use depending upon the surface condition of your steel, and it's reported in the specification. So we have, you know, class A surfaces, class B surfaces, and so on and so forth, and then the spec tells us if this is your surface condition, then use this value for uh, your coefficient. Um, now, generally, like I said, the coefficients of kinetic friction are lower. The, the coefficient of static friction is higher. The, the, uh, if you want a um, ballpark, you know, rule of thumb, coefficients of kinetic friction are about 75% of coefficients of static friction, but that's not always the case. It's, you know, it, it, any... Uh, uh, surface, any any two surfaces are going to have different behaviors. Again, the best way to do it or to figure this out is to just do it experimentally. Just, you know, develop a controlled experiment, measure your responses, and, and record the data. Uh, the next uh, parameter, like I said, is the normal force, okay? So what I mean by normal is perpendicular to the plane. So if I have an object and I have a plane that's at an angle, I'm going to take that object's weight, let's say, and I'm going to split it up into X and Y components, okay? And so you can think of the normal force in as sort of the sum of all the normal compor uh, components of the forces applied, applied to the system. So think of in as sort of the plane's reaction to those normal loads, right? So if I have, let's say I have this square block and that block weighs 20 pounds. Well, 20 pounds on an inclined ramp does not mean that the normal force is 20 pounds because if you take that ramp and you put it at an angle, some of that's going to go into the ramp and some of it's going to want to cause the block to slide down the ramp. So you have to take it, you split it up into its X and Y components. You do have to be a bit careful though. Um, so when you're dealing with inclined surfaces, you, know, you, you uh, split that load up into X and Y components, but you got to be a bit careful with that. Um, so like, for example, if, you know, if you have a, um, 
uh, a, a load that's you know at an incline let's say it's at a 5 to 12 and I'm just using this this object for uh, discussion purposes but if I take this and I split it up into X and Y components that object is laying much more horizontally than it is vertically so the uh, uh, so you know if you split or if you compute x and y components you might think oh well the horizontal component's bigger no 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 the vertical component is bigger think we're talking about a perpendicular line so you almost have to flip your slope ratio see the 12 is now associated with the vertical component and the 5 is associated with the horizontal component and again think about the physics right if i have an object that's on the sidewalk and that sidewalk just has a little bit of tilt to it like most of the force is going to go into the sidewalk. So you can almost use a little bit of common sense and go, this is the way the force has to go just because of the physics of the situation. Um, and, I, and I found that the physics, like if you understand the core physics, that it tends to explain the math that goes into it a, a, a lot more uh, easily. And I think that the easiest way to really, you know, ensure that we're understanding what's going on is, of course, with an example. So I have a, a, this... Um, uh, I have this block, it's a 300 pound block, and it's on a plane that's inclined at a three to four slope ratio. Um, I have a 100 pound force also acting on the plane, and I've given you the coefficients of static and kinetic friction. And so I wanna know whether or not the, this box or this crate is in equilibrium, okay? Now there's a couple points I wanna you know, um, talk about. Uh, first off, um, uh, and, and we might play around with this problem a bit just to sort of, you know, test our understanding of, of exactly what's going on. So two points to consider. First off, the 300 pound load is a weight. Okay, so the 300 pounds, that's how much the box weighs. Okay, now I don't care what's going on with the ramp or the inclination of the ramp, what, what angle the, the ramp is. Weights act downward. Okay, if I have a 300 pound box and I drop it, it's falling straight down. Okay, so weights always act downward. We have to take that weight and we have to split it up into X and Y components, but this ramp is more horizontal than it is vertical. It's a four to three. So that means that the vertical component, the, the, the normal force has to be the bigger component. Okay, um, and then we also have this 100 pound load that, that we have to consider. Once we get finished with the problem, I'm gonna ask a couple follow-up questions, like what if that 100 pound load wasn't there? What if the angle of inclination changed? We'll, we'll sort of test our understanding uh, of what's going on. So let me stop share here. Let me bring my computer back into the, onto this side of the, the, uh, the desk. Kind of a tangent question, could air resistance technically be considered a normal force? Um, no, but air resistance can generate friction resistance. I, 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 let me let me address that here here in a second. Um, give me a sec. I, I apologize. Let me get the share started, and then I'll I'll address that in a little bit more detail. Why is my uh? Hold on. My screen has frozen. Give me one sec. Uh, my apologies. I may have to like refresh this page a second. Um, give me one sec, okay? Okay. All right. I think I'm I'm still here. My the internet was um was being a bit uh funky on me. Okay, so go back to your question about air resistance. Um, I wouldn't treat air resistance as a normal force. Instead, what I would do is just treat air resistance as a force opposing motion. So for instance, if I'm driving down the road and I'm driving, you know, 60 miles an hour, you know, down whatever street, whatever Interstate 64, okay, that's obviously, you know, a force. I have a, you know, you know, let's say a force, let's say I'm accelerating down um, uh, interstate 64, so that's a force going in that one direction. But there is a force opposing that motion because obviously there's air I'm driving through. So that would just be a force acting in the opposite direction. Modeling that force is a function of fluid mechanics and properties of air and properties of the object that's going through 
uh, uh, the motion and whatnot. But uh, so, so that's how it handle. I wouldn't consider it a normal force. It would just be a frictional resistance. Does that make sense? Okay, good deal. All right. Um, now let's take a look at this. Um, let's take a look at this uh, problem here. Now, first off, I've got the triangle here, right? And this is three, this is four, and this is five. Now, if you want, you can say, okay, I need to compute the, you know, this angle and then take the sine and cosine, uh, you know, to compute the components. But remember, the cosine of this angle is just four over five, and the sine of this angle is just three over five. That's what the triangle's for. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take 300 pounds, and I'm just going to multiply it by three fifths and 300 pounds and multiply it by four fifths. Okay. And so when you do this, um, uh, you got 300 times three fifths, three fifths is 0. 0.6. So this is 180 pounds and this is 240 pounds. Okay. Ho hopefully that should be pretty straightforward. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, see if I can take this problem and split it up into X and Y components. Now, what do I mean by X and Y components? So here's the ramp, okay? And the slope ratio on this ramp is three to four, okay? So the ramp is more horizontal than it is vertical. So if you want something that's like really extreme, maybe think of something like, I don't know, like one to 12. That's like the ramp that we use for uh, uh, disability ramps to be on uh, 1 to 12 slope ratios. Okay. Now, I've taken this and I've split it up into X and Y components. If I've split this up into X and Y components, um, you know, think the larger component would be, you know, perpendicular to the plane and the smaller component would be going that way. Okay. So, what I'm proposing is, you know, here's my box. And I've got these X and Y components. X and Y, I'm sort of referring to X and Y in this direction. I want to take these components and, and represent them with respect to the ramp, okay? So I propose that the Y component, so we'll say, you know, that's the center of the box, the Y component is going to go like this, and this is going to be 240 pounds. And I'm pointing into the, the plane because, I mean, just think about the physics of it. If I have a 300-pound box on an incline ramp, that box is going to be pushing onto the ramp, right? Now, that's the, the Y component. What about the X component? Which way do you think the X component should go? So I have got this 180 pounds. Should go that way or that way? To the left, exactly. Right? If I've got this ramp and i got a 300-pound uh, box on it, it's going to want to slide down the ramp, right? So the 180 pounds is going to go that way. Now, I also have from here, this 100 pound force pushing on the ramp or pushing on the box. Okay. So what I need to do is figure out a couple parameters. Okay. So first off, let's sum forces in the y direction. And so we'll say you know, that by, by Y direction, I'm talking about that way being, uh, being positive. So I have a 240 pound force, which I'm going to call negative because, you know, think this is my, that's my positive Y direction and the 240 pounds is going in the opposite direction of that. And so you know, that's negative. What's resisting that? What's resisting that is the reaction from this inclined plane. And that reaction is the normal force, okay? And so that's gonna be plus N. So 
in is 240 pounds going that way. All right. Now, let's look at some of forces in the x direction. And so we'll say, you know, that way is positive, you know, like up the ramp. Okay. So I've got this positive 100 pounds. I've got this negative 180 pounds. Huh. What's got to happen in order to maintain equilibrium? Like in order for the box to maintain equilibrium, what's got to happen? Somebody help me out in chat. I'm going to ask you. Well, yeah, I mean, friction, yeah, but but let's talk about the numbers, okay? So I've got 100 pounds going up the ramp, and i got 180 pounds going down the ramp. So i got to have 80 pounds. There we, there we go. That's what I'm after. So, so basically, I need some frictional force going up the ramp, right? So that's what's got to happen, okay? So, you know plus F equals zero. So F is 80 pounds going that way. All right, so is everybody with me so far? Well, well, let me let me get to that question here in a second, Mr. Page. I, I see what, I see what you said, and I want to address that a, like a little bit more largely, okay? But you're kind of on to something, okay? Now, so here here's here's what I want to to answer, or here I want I want to uh, address the problem a little bit differently. Um, I propose in order for the box to be in equilibrium, okay, the, uh, the normal force must be 240 pounds and I must develop a friction of 80 pounds, okay? Now, the friction force is pointing up the ramp, okay? The reason why is, you know, friction always wants to resist motion, always wants to act in the opposite direction of, of motion. The box is heavier than this 100 pounds. So it's wanting to slide down the ramp. The frictional force is, is, is acting upward. So, so we have an, in order to maintain equilibrium, there must be an 80 pound force pushing up the ramp. But here's, here's what I want to look at, at. I want to look at maximum available static friction. Okay. Now the maximum available static friction is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. Okay. Now what is the coefficient of static friction? Okay. So the coefficient of static friction that was given to us earlier in the problem, right? The coefficient of static friction is 0 0.25. All right. And then the normal force is, what was the normal force? Normal force is 240 pounds. So what's 0.25 of 240 pounds? What is that? 60. All right. So 60 pounds. All right. Now, what I want somebody in this class to do is I want you to compare this number and this number. And I want you to see if you can make a conclusion about what's going on. I'm going to tell me what's going on. That's not enough. But so, so what does that mean? What's happening? The, well, all right, all right, yeah, here we go. I, I'm loving this. Okay, so, all right. 
Now let, let's let's discuss this a little bit. So we've got the box going up the ramp. We've got the box sliding down the ramp. Okay, so let, let's let's and then we have this 20 pounds of force, maximum pounds of force. We gotta we gotta discuss this a little bit. Okay. And uh, I think Mr. Fishball is on to something. So let me, let me explain what's going on. Okay. In order to maintain equilibrium, okay, the, we need to develop a friction of 80 pounds going up. But we can't do that. Okay. We can only develop a force of 60 pounds going up. So what that means is there's too much force acting down the ramp acting, you know, in the negative X direction. So what that means is the box is sliding down the ramp. It's sliding down the ramp because I don't have enough force to keep it up the ramp, okay? So F greater than F max, box is sliding down. Okay, so the problem originally asked, is the crate in equilibrium? No, no, the crate is not in equilibrium, okay? The, the crate is not in equilibrium because we need more friction than we actually have. Now, um, there were some questions about, you know, sliding up the ramp or sliding down the ramp with 20 pounds of force. Now, now you got the 20 pounds of force because you compared the 80 pounds and the 60 pounds, right? But let's go back to the example with the couch, right? You're at your buddy's house and you're pushing a couch across the, uh, uh, across the carpet. It's easier to keep that couch moving than it is to start it moving. I propose that we've already passed the point where the couch is is uh, is moving. Here's what I want to ask. How much friction is generated actually with this problem? Is it 60 pounds? Now, Mr. Fishball says 48 pounds. Why is Mr. Fishball saying that? I wonder. He's saying that because the box is moving, right? We do not have enough friction to keep the box from moving. So it's moving. So what is the frictional force that's developed? It's the kinetic force. It's 48 pounds. And so where did, uh, I think it was um, Mr. Fishball, where did Mr. Fishball get the 32 pounds? He got the 32 pounds because there is force pushing up, right? You got the 100 pounds. You got the, the X and Y components of the box. There's an unbalance of 80 pounds. The ramp provides 48. So 32 pounds of force is pushing the box down the ramp. So here's really what's going on. This is the, the real life problem. The real life problem is this. Here's the ramp. Here's the box. Here's the center of the box. The box, the, the internal weight of the box is pushing down that way. Somebody out here is pushing with 100 pounds. The box is sliding down and friction is resisting that motion. And unfortunately with this problem, the sum of the forces in the X direction are not zero. That box is moving, right? That box is accelerating down the ramp.
Now I want to have the, I want everybody to sort of chew on this for a bit. I want to see if there's any questions because I want to just plant some seeds into your head for your homework assignment. I want you to think about this for a bit, but I want to see if there's any questions. Where's the 32 come from? There you go. All right, that's a great question. So. Right. So we have, you know, negative 180, right? Because here's, maybe I should just do sum of forces because it's not, it's not equal to zero. We have negative 180 going down the ramp, 100 going up the ramp, 48 going up the ramp. What is negative 180 plus 100 plus 48? It's 32. Or negative 32. Because it's 32 pounds going down the ramp. That, no, that That's a great question. See, that's the thing. Friction really isn't all that difficult as long as you just understand that, you know, the box is either moving or it's not. And if it's moving, you're generating kinetic friction. If it's not, you're generating static friction. That's all there is to it. So let's conduct a little bit of a thought experiment. Because this isn't really all that difficult. And this isn't taking any of the, the knowledge and parameters um, that we're not used to, but I want to take this problem and look at it a little differently. Okay, let's go back up here. What if the angle changed, right? So this is a three to four slope ratio, right? Uh, so, you know, I, I could compute this in terms of an angle. What if that angle changed? What if instead of a 3 to 4 slope ratio, it was a 3 to 12 slope ratio? Would the box slide down the ramp then? Maybe what is the angle required in order to make those sum of forces zero, right? There, there's another point. Um, what about, uh, what if that 100 pounds wasn't there? Or what if the 100 pounds increased, right? It's really not that difficult. All you're doing is just, you know, it's taking a lot of the X and Y components that we've done and just adding one more point. See, all you're doing is computing a reaction and then asking, based on the coefficient of static friction, is that reaction possible? That's basically all you're, all you're doing with the friction problem. It's, it's no different than any of the problems that we've done before. Does this make sense? I want to see if there's any questions on this. Any other questions before we call it? I want to sh pull, oh, actually, I want to pull something up real quick. Let me see if I have time on that. Well, I don't want to pull that up because that's that's on the solution. Um, if you understood this, the the homework assignment that you've got uh, is is really pretty straightforward. What I did is it, it's basically a very similar problem. Uh, all I did was take the hundred pound load, if you will, and put it at an angle. Um, but I think you're going to find this is um, this is a pretty doable assignment, and I, and I think it's a really nifty thought experiment to you know, not really so much on the friction side of things, but it's really testing your understanding of the other concepts in statics. You know, what are the, the reaction forces required to keep the block in equilibrium, and are those reaction forces possible? I mean, until this point right here where we determine the maximum available static friction, this was really no different than any other statics problem, and that's really the overall point uh, I would make. Uh, any other questions before we call it?
All right, so here's what we're going to do to, to call it. You have one final assignment, if you will, for me. That's due Wednesday. Um, and then on Wednesday, we're going to have a full-blown comprehensive course review. We're going to go through basically everything that's, you know, potentially going to be on the final. Um, what I would suggest is those notes should be available already on Blackboard. In fact, let me check to verify that uh, before we call it. Let me check. Hold on for one second. Yeah, those notes are actually already on Blackboard right now, uh, Lecture 40. I would take a look at them because uh, I would sort of, you know, start to think about, you know, the course as a whole in your head and then maybe come to class Wednesday prepared with some questions, but really come to class Friday with some questions because Friday is basically going to be me logging on and answering anything and everything that I, that I can. Uh, that's all I have uh, for class today. Unless anybody has any questions, I will see you all on Wednesday. Anybody have any questions? Well, all right. Well, all right. I will see you all on Wednesday. That's all I have. Let me stop the share. I'll stop the recording. We'll see you then.